this um, lecture was originally intended for people who've only been playing clarinet for about a year, but I know some of you are more advanced. So the things I'm going to talk about really do apply not only to new clarinetists, but also to more experienced players. And I'll give you as much information as I can in the next 20 minutes. I would also love to uh, answer some questions. So open up the Q&A box if you have them, or just put a couple of question marks um, in front of your comment in the chat and I'll try and answer it. But here's my thoughts on clarinet fingering. It's something that is frustrating and challenging to most of us. And there's two main things that I like to think about that make our clarinet fingering easier. And one of them is being really mindful of like how the best way to hold our fingers and move our fingers is. So I'm definitely going to talk about that. And the second thing is how to practice more efficiently. You don't have to practice for hours and hours to succeed. You have to practice really well. And I'm going to share some of my thoughts on that. And I'm going to give you some resources that hopefully will make this easier for you. So um, this has been so much fun for me to interact with all of you. In our first two, where we talked about embouchure and air and articulation, there were some things that could make an instant difference. And you'd feel really satisfied, like, oh, I just changed my clarinet angle. I sound better. With fingering, these are some movements you need to train into your body. So this video will be posted on the ICA uh, YouTube channel. I encourage you to refer back to it, take notes, because it's not going to make an instant difference. But if you keep this up in weeks or months, you're going to notice a huge difference. So I'm going to jump in and talk about how to hold your fingers. First of all, um, if you were just to make little hand puppets, so wherever you are, try this with me, kind of um, make your hand puppets talk to each other and notice the shape of your fingers, the way they naturally move. They are rounded, they're arched. And if we're doing this fairly relaxed, that pretty well is exactly how we want our fingers to look on our clarinet. So what I could do is have a kind of like Pac-Man, those of you who know Pac-Man, I could just have it come right onto my clarinet and notice this natural relaxed shape. Most of us don't do that when we pick up clarinet. We're concentrating, we're thinking of it, and our fingers kind of do this. They squish at this knuckle. That makes it a lot harder to move them. So we want to make sure we have that nice, round, relaxed shape. And if you were just to cover all the holes on your clarinet, the main holes on the front, with that arched, relaxed shape, I like to call this home position. And we want to train our fingers to stay really close to home so that when we lift them up, they only go about that far off the keys. That's not our normal instinct. Usually we fly them around and we smack them down. And what takes training is to get them moving a little bit and to come down gently. And I've heard some great um, you know, references. For me, sometimes I like to feel like I'm moving underwater so that I'm moving my hands slowly. As they come down, it's like I'm squishing a marshmallow. So the closer I get to the key, the slower it gets. And how would I train my fingers to do that? What I would do is look in a mirror so I could see it or a video screen. And I would just start with one finger at a time and just kind of lift one finger and I might notice at first, maybe this is my normal behavior. You can see this finger is really flying around. So I'm going to notice that, pull it in, and train it to move less. When that looks good, I go to the next finger. Now, I want to make sure I don't progressively lift my hands up. As soon as I start seeing that, I rein it in. And here's the way our bodies and brain work. If I'm really concentrating on that, all I'm thinking about is one finger. I only need to do it for 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds till it feels like I've got it, and then I move on. And if I did that just with my left hand for two weeks, so maybe we're talking two and a half minutes a day for two weeks, it's going to radically change what feels normal, and it's going to start creeping into our pieces of music where we have lots of other things to think about. So I'm a huge believer in short, focused exercises where we're really concentrating on training our brain and body and just doing it over time repetitively. And that's going to be kind of one of the themes as I'm talking about how we practice here. Same thing for our right hand. There are some tools that help you get this feeling. I'll just show you two of my favorites. So one of them 
is if you've got fingers that fly and smack, you can just take a rubber band and um, you can just take one, sort of wrap it around a finger and then, and then just move that finger. I can, without me trying to hold it, here's one of my favorite contraptions. I linked a bunch of rubber bands together like luggage tags and now I have like a little bungee cord on my stand. And if I pull harder, I have more tension. If I get closer, I have less but I'm just going to put that on my finger and then do the same exercise. But now as I close my finger, the rubber band will slow it down for me. This is a really good tool to train your fingers to move more gently. More advanced players, you probably know when the music gets hard, that's when we concentrate and smack, 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 and that slows us down. So great tuning tool. Just make yourself a, a clarinet bungee cord and uh, help your fingers out. Another one uh, that was designed by an Australian clarinetist, it's a device called classical fingers. I love this thing. It, it, there's two rubber bands I've put on my instrument with magnets. Oopsie, sorry, I just had it upside down there. And it pops onto the clarinet like that. It's a beautiful plastic shield. And what this does, if I move my fingers too high, I'll hit it and it just gives me and awareness. So if I'm playing my scales, I just leave it on my clarinet and practice with it. It's high enough. It doesn't interfere with our tone, but it'll really help you notice where your fingers fly. You take it off like that. So you can see there's magnets on it. And uh, it's just another tool to help train us as we're working on our body. I want to point out something about the left hand in particular. And one of our biggest challenges on clarinet is the the phrase crossing the break i'm sure you've heard it where we go from our low register into the next register the clarion the high register and oftentimes what makes it hard is we don't have our left hand in the right position and so it's really important that we train our left hand to probably be different than what feels natural and uh, in particular we're gonna i'm gonna draw your attention to your top finger on the left hand, our index finger. Our normal instinct is to cover the hole here. And then when I go up to the A key above it, we lift our finger up and press the A key down. That's uh, intuitive. And every single clarinetist I've seen does that naturally. But this key is designed, notice how it kind of um, curves down. It's designed for us to roll up to it. And I have just a simple little exercise to help you notice how your finger should do it. And again, if you can look in a mirror, this is a great exercise. What we're gonna do is play low C. If you have longish fingers, I recommend your left hand tilts up a little bit. So you see my fingers are not perpendicular. They're actually tilting up. Now you still have to make sure your, your little finger can hit all those side keys. So, you know, do whatever fits your hand, but tilting up gives us an advantage. Here's the exercise. I'm gonna play low C. While I'm playing low C, I'm gonna roll my top finger up and open up that hole. This is a nonsense note. It might squeak, it's gonna sound bad because I'm still covering the hole at the same time. But what it's gonna show me is what part of my finger could open that hole um, while I'm still really close to home position, while I'm actually covering home position. So here's the exercise. Again, this won't sound good, it's a training exercise. <laughs> a few times and what, what I want you to pay attention to is what part of your finger is hitting the key. It's usually kind of the side of your knuckle. So now I'm going to morph into actually playing C to A. So that means I'm lifting my thumb, lifting my fingers, but again in that home position roll, trying to lift them not very much. <laughs> training. It's, it doesn't feel natural, but really important. And again, if you did it for like one minute every day for a couple weeks, it starts to feel much easier and you're really going to see the payoff. Um, if we have to go from an A up to a high B natural, which is really common fingering. If my fingers are only moving this much, it's not that hard. If they're moving like this, it's really hard. The other um, thing that we can't see in a mirror, so maybe you can put yourself on video from the side or even sort of more almost like your back to the camera, is our left thumb. A lot of people don't put their left thumb in the optimum position. 
And so here's what I like to do when I'm playing a low note, like my F, I actually try and have the tip of my thumb already touching the register key so that I can go from a low note to a high note with that much movement. I see a lot of people moving it a lot and getting off track. And so our throat tone B flat, that's the B flat right in the middle of the staff where we have our A key and our thumb key. Most people will lift their fingers up, put them here. And these two digits are so far out of home position, it's really hard to get to that high note. But I've already trained my front finger now to roll. I wanna do the same thing with my back finger. So the exercise we just did, C to A, you could also go C to B flat. And now I'm focusing on my left thumb not moving. And if I'm holding my clarinet out in front of me, like I'm doing right now to show you, I can just look at it. I could finger that and see if I'm moving it too much or if I'm moving it just a little. So again, training my fingers to barely move. Um, in a couple of weeks, that can make a significant difference to how well your fingers move around. So. With our right hand, um, again, we want to have that comfortable position um, where you put your thumb on your on your uh, thumb rest can make a difference to how easy it is for your hand. So again, just kind of make that hand puppet, move it onto your clarinet. And generally, I find my right hand, it's better to have it almost perpendicular. A lot of people get in the habit of resting the clarinet weight on their index finger. That's a bad habit. We want to have a little space there. So if uh, the weight of the clarinet feels heavy, cushy thumb rest cushion like I have helps. I use a neck strap. I, I find it just takes weight off my clarinet, makes it easier to move my fingers around. Lots of great ones. This one is by BG. They have a variety of them. I really like them. They have some that are a little springy. If you move a lot or cue people in chamber music, I like the springy ones. Um, People I know who don't move a lot prefer the more rigid chord where they set it and it's just in their optimum position. Anyway, that's something that sometimes makes fingering easier for you. Now, how to practice. Uh, I think that there's part of our brain that learns patterns and loves patterns. And most of us, when we're learning a new piece of music, we start at the beginning, we play through it, yeah, we might stop if we make a mistake and then we kind of keep going. Um, but often, if we really become mindful in our practice process, we might notice that we're getting really good at mastering our mistakes. And so um, there's kind of two things I like to think about with finger technique. First of all, I, I almost consider we have like this mental toolbox. In the toolbox are all the patterns that we've practiced regularly over time so that they start to feel automatic. And once they're automatic, we could be playing a piece of music and we come upon it and our brain would go, oh, that's pattern 312. I know that one so well, I don't have to think about it. Obviously this is all going on at an unconscious level. So what we wanna do is sort of program some patterns. And I'll just give you an example of what that would look like. I'm going to um, share something for you. Oh, in fact, for those of you who are on Zoom, I'll, I'll try and put two PDFs in there that you might find helpful but um, I'm just gonna put one up right now to share with you. And it's gonna have two things. So you can see I've got this finger pattern section here. Um, before I talked about playing really slowly where we were just kind of moving one finger at a time. Well, that was to train this idea of not moving much, but also I just wanna get common patterns in. So if I were to do finger pattern number one, Here's the exercise. You start at whatever speed is comfortable for you. And if you're a brand new clarinetist, those are often the first five notes we play. And so a great place to start. You would start it slowly and you might be looking in a mirror. It doesn't take, it's not too hard to memorize that pattern, watching all those habits, but you just loop it. So right now I have it written with a whole note at the end, but sometimes I'll just make this into a quick loop, kind of like this. Now, I condense that to going pretty fast pretty quickly, but what you might do is do it very slowly and gradually speed up. 
And what you want to look for is a point where you're not really thinking about it, but it feels like you're on autopilot. And as part of your normal clarinet playing routine, you should always be working on finger patterns. And you got lots of time to play clarinet. Most of us are going to be playing for the next few years. And if you're going to be playing for a few years anyway, what if you just said every week you want to toss two or three patterns into your patterns toolbox? In the long run, it makes your clarinet playing much better. Now, down here, we have some that are a lot harder. We have four sharps, but it doesn't matter how hard it is. If we start it very slowly and kind of work through these patterns, if especially if it's about five notes top. So I deliberately wrote these as five note patterns. That's kind of like a magic number around five to six max, our brain can quickly assimilate into a pattern. So again, as I said, if you're just joining me, the things we're talking about now take a couple weeks to make a difference on, but they really make a difference long term. So keeping our fingers close, arched and practicing in patterns. There's something else on this page. And um, in fact, I'm going to put this when I stop sharing the screen, I'll put this PDF into the chat. So those of you who would like to have it as a resource can, it's the bottom rhythm here, rhythms to practice finger patterns. So there's two different sets here, one A, B, and C, and two A and B. One of my favorite tricks for practicing something that's fast and challenging is not to, well, one of the ways we instinctively do is just play it really slowly many times. And that is a good technique, but I don't think it's the best technique. Um, often when I am encountering a new piece of music and there's something really hard, that's absolutely what I'll do at first. I'll just play it slowly. But I think we can disrupt our brain a bit, kickstart it if we add some variety. And what that is, is practicing it in different rhythms. So let me use for an example, um, here on these finger patterns, this first one that has four sharps. For a lot of us, maybe that's not so comfortable because we have, oh, I have to use my right hand, E, oh, left hand, F sharp, G sharp, A. Okay, there's maybe some pinky patterns there that are unusual. And so at first, I might just play it slowly to figure it out. I need to go slower than that. But once you kind of feel like, okay, I kind of know what my fingers are supposed to do, then here's the rhythm patterns. The first three go together. I'm going to condense this because we only have about three minutes left, but just to show you how it works. And then you can try this on your own time. The first one, we take these four notes and we go slow, slow, quick, quick. And I would do each of these patterns about three to five times, starting slowly repeating them, speeding it up. So here's what the first one sounds like. And then I would go da da di da di da da di da 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 gradually speeding it up. Then I go to the second one where now the two quick notes are at the beginning. And I would do that, repeating it a few times. And then I go to the third one where the quick notes are in the middle. And by the time I've done all three of those, I'm doing bits of it really fast, but then I hit the slow notes and my brain and fingers can kind of rest. The combination of the three, usually if we have so if I did each of those, let's say five times, that whole loop would probably take me maybe a minute, maybe a minute and a half. Then I play it as written. And sometimes it feels like magic. It'll startle me as to how well that works. So that's a great one. I'll quickly look at um, 2A and 2B. Although I've written these as dotted eight sixteenths, it's really long, short and short, long. The first time we do it, it's just like a, a, a slow swing rhythm. Ba, da, di, da, da. Again, I do it slowly enough that I'm not going to have any mistakes. Each time I repeat it, I'm going to keep my beat slow, but the long note gets longer, the short note gets shorter. So the second time, ba, da, 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 da. the third time, ba, um, ba, um, ba, um. and then I flip it so that I have short long. And those two ways of 
practicing when you have something with hard hard fingering it really helps get it into our brain a lot faster and uh, i'm going to put that into the chat for those of you that are here um, in case that would be helpful for you so it's just called the finger patterns worksheet oh actually i can't put that in the chat so i'll send it through to jessica and on the youtube replay that can be there for you um, also, if you go to fasterclarinetfingers.com, I have uh, a series of free training videos with worksheets, and I think this worksheet is from that, so you would get it as well. But I just really encourage you to record yourself on video and look at your fingers. Notice where they tend to move a lot. Start to think about keeping them closer to the keys and incorporate patterns, five to six note patterns that you just do up and down until they feel easy. Our brain is so powerful. It learns patterns really quickly. And eventually, when you get your pattern toolbox full, it makes a huge difference to how easy it is to sight read new music and how, uh, how easy it is to learn new patterns because our brain gets used to learning patterns. So as I said, today's not quick fix, but it's relatively quick fix. It's stuff that will really help you out in the long run. Um, so we have like one or two minutes left. Anybody have any questions? There is a question in the Q&A. Let me just take a quick look from Craig. Are there rules for knowing which fingerings to use, particularly when music becomes more advanced? Well, that's a great question, Craig. Where that especially comes to mind is sometimes when we hit the altissimo, our third register, where there's lots of different fingerings. Um, the answer is really what works for you. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll look at a fingering chart and in slow motion, I'll try a couple fingerings. When it's in the altissimo, there's so many fingerings. If it's slow and exposed, I generally want to pick fingerings that are the best in tune and have the best response. So even if that means awkward fingerings, if it's slow enough moving, I might do that. But if it's really fast, then I might want the combination where it's easiest to move my fingers. And if it's a little bit harder to play in tune, maybe if it's going diggy, 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 so fast, the listener might not notice, then I'm gonna go more in favor of fingering ease than, than tone and response. It's kind of a personal decision, but that's my rough guideline when we're up in that register. All right, well, I know that there is another session starting very soon that looks really good. And so I don't wanna go over time because that's about to start. But I thank you all for being here. If you're watching the YouTube video, thank you so much. There's so many great events still coming at Clarinet Fest. So uh, enjoy them. And I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you so much, Michelle. Great. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.